So when you um, when you do speeches, uh, one of the things about doing speeches is you really want the people before you to be rubbish. <laughs> Uh, and the other thing you want is loads of time <laughs> to talk about your ideas. And so basically, I've just listened to two people who are really, really brilliant, and I've got about 10 minutes to do my, <laughs> my 40 point speech. So I'm not, really fu I'm not really funny, that's the problem, to be honest. It's good, yeah. it's good to be at the National Geographic Society. Someone said, someone said to me the other day, What's so, what's so great about Switzerland? I said, I, I don't know, but you, you have to admit the flag's a big plus. Um, shall, I just, nah, shall I get off now? Did, stay. stay? Okay. Right. Actually, Sue was boasting about, um, about the royal family. Um, and actually, I met someone in the royal family yesterday, someone very royal. And, um, and we were, anyway, we were talking uh, a bit. You, know, you don't get to talk to them for very long, but you get, you get two or three minutes. So, so, so she said to me, uh, how are things that you're organized? I don't think she knew what my organization was, to be honest. But she said, how are things that you're organization? And I said, well, you know, it's fine, it's good. And, um, and you know, I've been running it for lots of years, so I devolve things, and I have time to do other stuff, and I do a bit of broadcasting. She said, oh, but what well, broadcasting, what do you do? And I said, well, so I'm on Moral Maze tonight, because I did Moral Maze last night. Uh, which is a program radio for, which is very, very irritating. So um, just warning you if you're thinking of listening to it. Um, and I said, oh, we're talking about Russia, uh, which is what we talked about last night. And I said, um, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't actually believe the arguments that I've got to make in the program to make the program work, because it's a kind of debating program. And she said, oh, she said, it must be terribly difficult to, to have to make an argument which you don't really believe. And I said to her, well, not really, ma'am, because I used to be in politics. Um, <laughs> and she laughed, to be honest. So that's, on, that's a tick. You know, on, my, on my deathbed, I can say a very senior royal person did laugh at something that I said. And, uh, and that's the kind of person I am. Now, um, so I've got very little time to make lots and lots of points. And uh, the reason I told you that story about the me member of the royal family is because, in, in a sense, I kind of do feel there's a little bit of false pretenses to me being here. Because... Uh, I'm here to talk about the Taylor Review. It took me a while to think of the name. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm here to talk about the review. And um, actually, that review uh, it really focused very much on people at the bottom end of the loan market. So I, I focused on um, basic protections, basic information for people, for casual workers in particular, ensuring they had access to sick pay, that they had things like a right to request a permanent contract when they've been a temporary or zero hours worker for a year, the idea of a higher minimum wage for hours that aren't guaranteed. So pretty that stuff, and I really focused at the bottom end. Um, I think when we think about policy, we always need to say, how does it affect the, most, the least advantaged people in society? So most of you, I think, are not so much focused on that, but more focused on questions about how do you recruit and how do you retain and how do you motivate talented uh, people. So there's a kind of question about the relevance of my work for what interests you, but I think there are a couple of things that are particularly relevant, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them. I am going to try and make 142 points in 11 minutes. So um, it, it might remind you a little bit of something. There was a, I don't even know how to mention Woody Allen anymore, but anyway, Woody Allen did once say... Uh, he once said, I've uh, done a speed reading course. He said, I read War and Peace uh, in two hours. Um, it's about Russia. Uh, so <laughs> you, you may not remember anything that I say, but j j if one thing, one thing, I'd be happy with one thing, to be honest. Anyway, so the first thing that maybe my review and what interests you have in common is the idea of good work. So uh, my report wasn't actually called the Taylor Review. It was called Good Work. And the government's response to my report uh, was called Good Work. They've got a lot of other things to do rather than thinking up names of the report, so they just copied mine. Um, uh, and I, I argued in my uh, review that there were five reasons why good work uh, matters. So I said, first of all, it's about a new social contract. So uh, if you're as old as me, you remember the post-war social contract. You remember the idea that if you work hard, if you have a job, you'll get better off every year and you'll be economically secure. Now, that is no longer a promise that we make to people. 
uh, it is no longer the case that if you work hard, you will be better off every year and you'll be economically secure. So for me, the very least we need to say to people is if you have a job, you will at least be treated with decency. And so I used the first line in my report was, every job should be fair and decent with scope for development and fulfillment. So first reason, social contract. Second reason, which you've already heard a lot about today and we'll hear a lot more about, is health and well-being. Bad work screws you up. And so bad work isn't just bad for the people who are affected by it, but those people are more likely to be unemployed, they're more likely to be using the health service, so there's an externality created by work which is demeaning or too pressurising or unfair, or which people have absolutely no scope for autonomy or for self-expression. Good work matters because we as a country have a huge problem with productivity. The statistics have gone up a little bit in the last few months, but most people think that's probably a blip. And part of the reason for our productivity challenge is that we don't manage people terribly well. So it's not just me as an old lefty saying this. If you talk to people like Charlie Mayfield, talk to business leaders, they will argue that part of our productivity problem is to do with the quality of management. And of course, people uh, are at the heart of that. And I argue that good work matters because we have a notion of citizenship. We want citizens to be active and to be engaged and to coin a phrase, to take back control. Um, but it, we still have an idea that that notion of active citizenship stops at the door of the office or the door of the factory or the door of the shop. And if we want active citizens, engaged citizens, people who take back control, we should want the same idea of citizenship at work. And the final reason I said the good work matter was, is technology, which is something else that we're going to hear a lot about today, I'm sure. That there is a lot of kind of pessimism about technology, fear about technology. The robots are coming. We'll all be replaced by algorithms by next Tuesday, that kind of thing. Uh, and actually, we need to talk about technology in terms of how it's going to benefit human beings, how it's going to be better uh, for us. Um, and I want, let me just say why I think that's particularly important. Um, if you go back 10 years, if we'd been in a conference and we'd be talking about globalization, what you might have heard is you might have heard people saying the following things about globalization, particularly financial globalization. They'd have said it's an unstoppable force, so get out of the way. They'd have said there will be losers but they just need to suck it up because most people will gain. Or they would have said, it might mean that things that you care about, like you know, your capacity to pass your own laws or your borders or whatever, those things are going to have to go. They're just old-fashioned. They're out of date. You know, give them up. And fourthly, this financial globalization, it might look very complicated, but don't worry about it because there's really clever people in banks and they know what they're doing. Now, you might have noticed that's not gone terribly well as a discourse. <laughs> and that's, you know, there is not just Trump and it's not just Brexit and populism more generally. There is academics now, serious, thoughtful people are saying the story about globalization wasn't as straightforward as, as people said it was. But listen to how people talk about technology and you'll recognize the tune. You know, it's an unstoppable force. Get out of the way. There will be losers, but they just need to suck it up because most people will gain. It will mean that things that you care about, like your privacy, like protecting your children, like being able to raise taxes, but you just need to give that up. And um, you might not understand all this technology, but there's these really lovely people in California, and they wear jeans and they love their children. And you know they're in charge and it's all going to be, but that's not looking so good anymore either, is it? That, that last one. Um, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, that's the kind of, what a reputational roller coaster that is, eh? Um, uh, so, uh, when we talk about technology, we need to talk about, it, about how it's going to make work better. So, that idea of good work is a really important principle, and I'm really pleased that whatever the government does in terms of the individual recommendations that I made, I had 55 recommendations, and the government said they're going to deliver 53 of them. It turns out they're going to deliver about 20 of them and consult on another 33. But... Um, but they are committed to good work. They're committed to measuring the quality of work. They're committed to reporting on the quality of work. So this conversation about good work, what is good work, how do we measure good work, how do we know what it is, is here to stay. And, and I'm very proud of having made a, a contribution to that. In my remaining five minutes, I want to talk about another part of my um, review, which was that one of the issues I had to look at a lot was the, this, the boundary between self-employment and worker status. So you all know about the kind of court cases involving Uber and Deliveroo and other companies. And all those cases revolve around the issue of whether or not people are self-employed, which means they've got no real employment rights, and it also means that the firms who employ them don't have to pay employment taxes, or whether they're workers, in which case people would get rights and they would have to pay those taxes. And so I recommended that we needed to think about how it is we define those categories. Now, if you look at the self-employed, 
um, and this goes back to something I said at the beginning, you will see that there is a polarization. Um, that there is what the Resolution Foundation said, a split between the, preca the precarious self-employed. They're people who often would rather not be self-employed. They don't earn very much. They're often forced to declare themselves as self-employed by firms who want to avoid paying taxes. And the other side, the privileged self-employed. And that's basically people like me, who are kind of getting towards the, end of your, the, the middle of the end of their careers, and they decide to go, out on, on, go on their own, become consultants, become uh, freelancers. And actually, the fastest growth in self-employment in the last few years has been in that kind of privileged group of consultants, uh, self-employed people, sole traders, and people like that. And so there has, has come a view, which you will hear from you know, futurists who always like to kind of uh, extrapolate trends, that maybe this is the future of the world, that we will all... More and more and more people will want to be consultants, will want to be freelance, will want to work in that way. And, you know, you will hear that a lot. Uh, and I want to just conclude by saying that's not, I don't think that's true and explain why it's not true. So the first reason it's not true is quite prosaic, and I won't go into it, and that is that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is on the case. Um, <laughs> uh, he is really, really on the case, to be honest. And so... Uh, those tax benefits, those tax advantages associated with people being uh, self-employed, middle-class, better-off self-employed people and sole traders, some of those are going to be eroded, actually, and I would argue that there are good reasons uh, why we need a more uh, consistent uh, a tax uh, base. So that's going to have some impact, I think. But the other reason I don't think it's going to happen is because, actually, in the end, most of us want to work in organisations. And that's a kind of unfashionable thing to say at the moment, but I believe very strongly that it's true. And the reason I think it's true, there's lots of ways in which you could describe this, but the reason I think it's true goes back to a very fundamental account of human motivation. So there's an enormous literature about, literature about human motivation, and um, I read it all before I came here this morning. So, um, uh, on the tube. Uh, but if you boil that all, all, all down... Um, one way of thinking about human beings is that we are fundamentally motivated by three things, three types of um, energy, as it were. The first is authority. We are motivated by authority. We, are mo we do what we're told to do in one way or another. We're motivated by leadership and strategy and rules and regulations and all that kind of stuff. And an enormous amount of the time, every day, the stuff you do, you do because, in a sense, you're being told to do it, whether explicitly or implicitly. The second thing, the great thing that drives human motivation, all these things have got their roots in our evolution throughout human history, is belonging, being part of a tribe, the values that we have, the norms that we have, the things that we do because of the kind of person we think we are, because of the kind of group that we belong to. And then the third thing that motivates us is individual ambition and growth. Yeah? So these three things drive us, authority, values and belonging, and individual ambition. And one of the reasons why I don't think we'll ever have a world where people, most people don't work in organisations is that organisations provide those things. And in the end, if you're on your own, although it provides you with more autonomy, you are in a world where you are kind of relying on not having the motivation that comes from being part of some kind of authority structure, some kind of sense of purpose and leadership and direction, and often you're not part of a a tribe, and people miss not being part of a tribe. A friend of mine who was a consultant has gone back to an organisation and said that they were sick of being the only person who went to the annual office Christmas party. <laughs> um, now, the, so that's the good news for organisations. The good news for uh, those of us who want to, or are parts of organisations and want to recruit and retain and motivate people is that there are very strong human reasons why we want to work in organisations. The bad news is that getting those three things aligned, getting authority and values and team membership and individual growth and aspiration aligned, making them work together, is actually incredibly hard. In fact, I would say it's the core business of organisational management and leadership. And a friend of mine, Charlie Ledbeater, did a fantastic piece of work many years ago. He looked at the most innovative organisations in the world at that time, which is, he looked at, you know, everything from an amazing Indian social enterprise that was bringing affordable education to villages across India, uh, Cambridge um, Molecular Biology Lab that was winning Nobel Prizes, Pixar, the animators, even FC Barcelona, the football club. And he, he looked at them and said, what is it about these organisations that makes them so special? And at the end of his research, he came up with a phrase... I think a wonderful phrase to describe those organisations. He said, they are creative communities with a cause. Creative communities with a cause. And the reason I love that phrase so much is, is it's precisely about how it is you balance those three things that I've described. 
that it's a kind of leadership, a cause-based leadership, where people have a sense of purpose, but it's not a kind of overbearing, interfering leadership. There's a sense of community, but not a kind of inward-looking sense of community, a defensive sense of community, but one that is a community of people all committed to doing something amazing, whether it was making fantastic films or playing amazing football or, 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 or achieving scientific breakthroughs. And then finally, these are creative organisations, organisations where people have the scope and are encouraged to express themselves, to try things out, an environment is created where people can take manageable risks. So, I don't think the future is people not working in organisations. Um, uh, I think the challenge is, how do we become the kinds of uh, organisations that we need to be? Because actually when I talk to quite a lot of people who've gone off on their own, some of them do it because they want autonomy, they want freedom, they want the tax perks. But actually a lot of people who've done that say to me the reason they've done it is because they just got sick to death of corporate life. They got sick to death of a particular culture, particular dysfunctional ways in which organisations work. So organisations are the future, but we are going to have to think incredibly hard about how we have to change organisations to be able to meet the demands and expectations of the 21st century. If we can create organisations that are creative communities with a cause, then the future of work and the future of society will be great. But it's a challenge, and it's something that we have to think very hard about, about how we undertake it, how we achieve it. And I hope that's going to be something that we'll be talking about a lot for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, it's, it's a great shame that you didn't have more time, actually, because what you're touching at the heart, as, as head of global citizenship at Alexander Mann Solutions, the, the bit around getting people to understand that citizenship doesn't stop at the door is incredibly important. A quick one, have you got any examples of companies who do get it about bringing all those three parts together and making it all work? <laughs> there was a plug there, there was a plug. Anyone else apart from the RSA? Uh, well, no, I think, you know, you... you sorry, oh, I sat down, didn't I? Prematurely sat down and now I'll have to get off again. Go um, on. Uh, the thing I want to say is this. I could give you examples. There's, the, there's something which I'm sure some of you know about business books. And the golden rule of business books is when someone publishes a book about the best companies in the world, five years later, all those companies have gone bankrupt. And, <laughs> but, uh, and there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that balancing those things, getting the right balance of authority and kind of values and belonging and fairness and inclusion and individualism and allowing people to pursue their ambitions and to get ahead and, yes, to compete as well, that getting the balance is very, very difficult because they're constantly, these things fight against each other and also changes in the context and the environment upset the apple cart. So even when an organisation is working well, then competition or technology or public attitude, something comes along and undermines it. So I'm always kind of resistant to saying, look at that organisation because by the time you look at it, it may have changed. Creating, having organisations that are creative communities with a cause is not something you do once through one strategy. It is something that requires eternal and constant vigilance. Fantastic. Thank you very much.